5G rollout late 19, early 2020 as it coincides with the COVID-19 event as the uh, entire United States has been on, under lockdown. As of May, uh, today is May 6th as I'm making this video. Uh, they're talking about, you know, reopening businesses, slowly rolling it back in. Uh, 5G, is it connected with respiratory illnesses? Uh, the allergic asthma and non-allergic asthma triggers, okay, the symptoms and triggers. They're acknowledging that 5G would fall into the category of non-allergic trigger. It's allele. 5G has an allele. Okay, as, as you read this definition here, very interesting terminology to describe 5G. And Leo, an alternative version of a specific gene. So, if I can apply this terminology to 5G, this word allele deals with an alternative version of a gene. So, as you connect the dots here with this information that I'm showing you, 5G is genetic. It has, uh, I'm, I'm no expert by any means in this area of genes and, and uh, DNA and all this, but, but you know, common sense tells you as you read this information, as they describe a non a non-allergic trigger being 5G. They're, they're defining 5G as a non-allergic trigger for an asthma or respiratory issues, and they use the term allele with 5G. 5G has a, has genetic coding, obviously, to use the term allele. It has genetic coding. So uh, it, it, this is way beyond my my you know qualification to make this le le a legitimate study but on a on a layman's level it's obvious that 5g is much more than people realize as this doctor from new york will explain this uh, unprecedented um, experiences that he was having with individuals who were believed to have the regular, for lack of a better term, respiratory failure that causes, ultimately causes death. He experienced that it was not this regular respiratory failure that would, inc that would require respirators. In fact, the respirators wound up being more detrimental because of the fact that it was another type of trigger that was causing these respiratory failures in the patients that he dealt with. Now, <clears throat> I'm assuming this guy is real. Uh, anything's possible. But the fact that he put this, this YouTube up, uh, he gives a name, claims he's a doctor from New York. Didn't give a lot of numbers on how many patients, which probably kept him safe from getting flagged. I'm assuming I'm giving this guy the benefit of the doubt and I'm going to let this play. This is Dr. Cameron Kyle Fedel, ER and critical care doctor from New York City. Nine days ago, I opened an intensive care unit to care for the sickest COVID positive patients in the city. In these nine days, I have seen things I have never seen before. In treating these patients, I have witnessed medical phenomenon that just don't make sense in the context of treating a disease that is supposed to be a viral pneumonia. Nine days ago, I presumed I was opening an intensive care unit to treat patients with a virus causing a pneumonia that was ravaging lungs across the world, starting out as something mild, a uh, cough, a sore throat, and progressively increasing in severity until ultimately ending in something called acute respiratory distress syndrome syndrome or ARDS. This is the paradigm that every hospital in the country is working under. This is the disease ARDS that every hospital is preparing to treat. And this is the disease ARDS for which in the next two to six weeks, 100,000 Americans might be put on a ventilator. And yet, 
everything I've seen in the last nine days, all the things that just don't make sense, the patients I'm seeing in front of me, the lungs I'm trying to improve, have led me to believe that COVID-19 is not this disease and that we are operating under a medical paradigm that is untrue. In short, I believe we are treating the wrong disease, and I fear that this misguided treatment will lead to a tremendous amount of harm to a great number of people in a very short time. As New York City appears to be about 10 days ahead of the country, I feel compelled to get this information out. COVID-19 lung disease, as far as I can see, is not a pneumonia and should not be treated as one. Rather, it appears as if some kind of viral, it appears as some kind of viral-induced disease, most resembling high-altitude sickness. It is as if tens of thousands of my fellow New Yorkers are on a plane at 30,000 feet and the cabin pressure is slowly being let out. These patients are slowly being starved of oxygen. I have seen patients dependent on oxygen take off their oxygen and quickly progress through a state of anxiety and emotional distress and eventually get blue in the face. And while they look like patients absolutely on the brink of death, they do not look like patients dying of pneumonia. I have never been a mountain climber, and I do not know the conditions at base camp below the highest peaks in the world. Uh, but, I, uh, but I suspect that the patients I'm seeing in front of me uh, look most like uh, as if a person was dropped off on the top of Mount Everest without time to acclimate. Uh, I don't know the final answer of this disease, but I'm quite sure that a ventilator is not it. Uh, that is not to say that we don't need ventilators. We absolutely need them. Uh, they are the only way at this time that we're able to give a little more oxygen to patients who need it. Uh, but when we treat people with ARDS, uh, we typically use ventilators uh, to treat what's called respiratory failure. Uh, that is, uh, we use the ventilator to do the work that the patient's muscles can no longer do because they're too tired to do it. These patients' muscles work fine. I fear that we are, I fear that if we're using a false paradigm to treat a new disease, new disease, uh, that the method that we program the ventilator, one based on a notion of respiratory failure as opposed to oxygen failure, that this method, and there are a great many number of methods we can use with the ventilator, but this method being widely adopted at this very moment in every hospital in the country, which aims to increase pressure on the lungs in order to open them up, is actually doing more harm than good. And that the pressure we are providing, uh, that we are providing to lungs, we may be providing to lungs that cannot stand it, that cannot take it. And that the ARDS that we are seeing, that the whole world is seeing, may be nothing more than lung injury caused by the ventilator. Now, I don't know the final answer to this disease. Uh, I do sense that we will have to use ventilators. Uh, we will have to use a great many number of ventilators, and we need a great many number. Um, uh, illness or one that primarily affected the, the, the respiratory system. And thus, you know, out of the gate, we started talking about ventilators, and ventilators appeared to be the problem, but, or the part of the solution, I should say. But as we went along, we realized that, you know, it affects the blood and the immune system and the kidneys. And, and, uh, uh, and so the, the thinking in the beginning that this needed to be handled with ventilators and finding that 80 to 90 percent of the people who went on ventilators ended up dying. Did we approach this with the wrong methodology? Should we have looked to other areas and, and did we intubate too soon? Well, the doctors and nurses that are on the front line, they're watching every patient very closely. And they're watching them for what we call the oxygen level in the blood to really ensure because that's what you need for your brain and your heart and your kidneys to keep functioning. And so if your oxygen level falls too low and it cannot be kept up with just what we call nasal cannulas or rebreathing oxygen masks, if you can't get enough oxygen from that, then they will intubate the, the patient. I think it's very important to realize that that early report has been revised that was in JAMA that talked about that higher level mortality that you just mentioned. And it's very variable by age and it's very variable by length of time.
one based on a notion of respiratory failure as opposed to oxygen failure, that this method, and there are a great many number of methods we can use with the ventilator, but this method being widely adopted at this very moment in every hospital in the country, which aims to increase pressure on the lungs in order to open them up, is actually doing more harm than good. And that the pressure we are providing uh, that we are providing to lungs, we may be providing to lungs that cannot stand it, that cannot take it, and that the ARDS that we are seeing, that the whole world is seeing, may be nothing more than lung injury caused by the ventilator. Now, I don't know the final answer to this disease. Uh, I do sense that we will have to use ventilators. Uh, we will have to use a great many number of ventilators, and we need a great many number of ventilators, but I sense that we can use them in a much safer way. Uh, and a much safer method. Uh, that safer method challenges long-held dogmatic beliefs within the medical community and among lung specialists, which will not be easy to overcome. But I really believe uh, that they must be overcome. Uh, there are hundreds of thousands of lungs in this country at risk, and, and the time to overcome them is now. Uh, I'm confident that if those of us that work bedside with these patients, those of us who are witnessing the things that we have never seen before, despite the many years we have worked and the thousands of patients and diseases we have seen, if we can effectively communicate this to all those that are so important but who are not bedside, the researchers, the administrators, uh, those who procure our resources and make our protocols, the politicians, our own government, uh, if we are able to convince them that this is a disease that is different than anything we have ever seen, I'm confident that an answer can be found, uh, that effective treatments can be discovered, and that a plan to disseminate that treatment can be rapidly deployed, uh, and that tens of thousands and probably hundreds of thousands of lives and lungs will be protected. It, it, it's active again. <clears throat> you don't need more than two brain cells to work out where you go from here. Virus are neither dead nor alive. They in, inhabit hosts. If I put a virus inside a dormant bacteria that I know I can spring to life. I go to Norway on a holiday or Denmark or Sweden, I just spread the virus around the forests with the dormant bacteria and I come back. And I can wait, if I like, a hundred years, two hundred years, or two hours. Makes no difference to me. And then all no I have to, to do with and then all I have to do with harp or a similar device is put the frequency, the microwave frequency off the ionosphere down onto Norway, whenever I feel like it, the virus will spring to life because their host has sprung to life. This is where we are. So countries can now, just by introducing bacteriums and viruses and whatever, they can totally devastate uh, the economic possibilities of another country. COVID-19 lung disease, as far as I can see, is not a pneumonia and should not be treated as one. Rather, it appears as if some kind of viral, it appears as some kind of viral-induced disease, most resembling high-altitude sickness. It is as if tens of thousands of my fellow New Yorkers are on a plane at 30,000 feet and the cabin pressure is slowly being let out. These patients are slowly being starved of oxygen.